Brought to you by Wikivd Documentaries. Ted Bundy. Theodore Robert Bundy was an American serial killer, kidnapper, rapist, burglar, and necrophile who assaulted and murdered numerous young women and girls during the 1970s and possibly earlier. Shortly before his execution, after more than a decade of denials, he confessed to 30 homicides committed in seven states between 1974 and 1978. The true victim count remains unknown and could be much higher. Bundy was regarded by many of his young female victims as handsome and charismatic, traits that he exploited to win their trust. He typically approached them in public places, feigning injury or disability or impersonating an authority figure, before overpowering and assaulting them. At more secluded locations, he sometimes revisited his secondary crime scenes for hours at a time, grooming and performing sexual acts with the decomposing corpses until putrefaction and destruction by wild animals made further interaction impossible. He decapitated at least 12 of his victims, and kept some of the severed heads in his apartment for a period of time as mementos. On a few occasions, he simply broke into dwellings at night and bludgeoned his victims as they slept. Initially incarcerated in Utah in 1975 for aggravated kidnapping and attempted criminal assault, Bundy became a suspect in a progressively longer list of unsolved homicides in multiple states. Facing murder charges in Colorado, he engineered two dramatic escapes and committed further assaults, including three murders, before his ultimate recapture in Florida in 1978. He received three death sentences in two separate trials for the Florida homicides. Bundy died in the electric chair at Rayford Prison in Stark, Florida, on January 24, 1989. Biographer Ann Rule described him as a sadistic sociopath who took pleasure from another human's pain and the control he had over his victims, to the point of death. And even after, he once called himself the most cold-hearted son of a bitch you'll ever meet. Attorney Polly Nelson, a member of his last defense team, agreed, Ted, she wrote, was the very definition of heartless evil. Childhood Bundy was born Theodore Robert Cowell on November 24, 1946, to Eleanor Louise Cowell, known for most of her life as Louise, at the Elizabeth Lund home for unwed mothers in Burlington, Vermont. His father's identity has never been determined with certainty. His birth certificate assigns paternity to a salesman and Air Force veteran named Lloyd Marshall. But Louise later claimed that she had been seduced by a sailor, whose name may have been Jack Worthington. Some family members expressed suspicions that Bundy might have been fathered by Louise's own violent, abusive father, Samuel Cowell. But no material evidence has ever been cited to support or refute this. For the first three years of his life, Bundy lived in the Philadelphia home of his maternal grandparents, Samuel and Eleanor Cowell, who raised him as their son to avoid the social stigma that accompanied birth outside wedlock. At the time, family, friends, and even young Ted were told that his grandparents were his parents, and that his mother was his older sister. Eventually he discovered the truth though his recollection of the circumstances varied. He told a girlfriend that a cousin showed him a copy of his birth certificate after calling him a bastard, but he told biographers Stephen Michaud and Hugh Ainsworth that he found the certificate himself. Biographer and true crime writer Anne Rule, who knew Bundy personally, believes that he did not find out until 1969 when he located his original birth record in Vermont. Bundy expressed a lifelong resentment toward his mother for never talking 
to him about his real father, and for leaving him to discover his true parentage for himself. Bundy spoke warmly of his grandparents in some interviews, and told Rule that he identified with, respected, and clung to, his grandfather, but he and other family members told attorneys in 1987 that Samuel Cowell was a tyrannical bully and a bigot who hated blacks, Italians, Catholics, and Jews, beat his wife and the family dog, and swung neighborhood cats by their tails. He once threw Louisa's younger sister Julia down a flight of stairs for oversleeping. He sometimes spoke aloud to unseen presences, and at least once he flew into a violent rage. When the question of Ted's paternity was raised, Bundy described his grandmother as a timid and obedient woman who periodically underwent electroconvulsive therapy for depression and feared leaving the house toward the end of her life. Ted occasionally exhibited disturbing behavior even at that early age. Julia recalled awakening one day from a nap to find herself surrounded by knives. From the cowl kitchen, her three-year-old nephew was standing by the bed, smiling. In 1950 Louise abruptly changed her surname from Cal to Nelson and, at the urging of multiple family members, left Philadelphia with her son to live with cousins Alan and Jane Scott in Tacoma, Washington. In 1951 Louise met Johnny Culpepper Bundy, a hospital cook, at an adult singles night at Tacoma's First Methodist Church. They married later that year, and Johnny Bundy formally adopted Ted. Johnny and Louise conceived four children of their own, and although Johnny tried to include his adoptive son in camping trips and other family activities, Ted remained distant. He later complained to his girlfriend that Johnny wasn't his real father, wasn't very bright, and didn't make much money. Bundy's Tacoma recollections varied from biographer to biographer to Michelle and Ainsworth. He described roaming his neighborhood, picking through trash barrels in search of pictures of naked women. To Polly Nelson he spoke of perusing detective magazines, crime novels, and true crime documentaries for stories involving sexual violence, particularly when illustrated with pictures of dead or maimed bodies, yet in a letter to Rule he asserted that he never ever read fact detective magazines, and shuddered at the thought that anyone would. To Michaud, he described consuming large quantities of alcohol and canvas in the community late at night in search of undraped windows where he could observe women undressing, or whatever else could be seen. Accounts of his social life also varied, he told Michaud and Ainsworth that he chose to be alone as an adolescent because he was unable to understand interpersonal relationships. He claimed that he had no natural sense of how to develop friendships. I didn't know what made people want to be friends, he said. I didn't know what underlay social interactions. Classmates from Woodrow Wilson High School told Rule, however, that Bundy was well-known and well-liked. There, a medium-sized fish in a large pond. Bundy's only significant athletic avocation was snow skiing which he pursued enthusiastically using stolen equipment and forged lift tickets. During high school he was arrested at least twice on suspicion of burglary and auto theft. When he reached age 18 the details of the incidents were expunged from his record, as is customary in Washington and most other states. University years after graduating from high school in 1965, Bundy spent a year at the University of Puget Sound before transferring to the University of Washington in 1966 to study Chinese. In 1967 he became romantically involved with a UW classmate who is identified in Bundy biographies by several pseudonyms.
most commonly Stephanie Brooks. In early 1968 he dropped out of college and worked at a series of minimum wage jobs. He also volunteered at the Seattle office of Nelson Rockefeller's presidential campaign and in August attended the 1968 Republican National Convention in Miami as a Rockefeller delegate. Shortly thereafter Brooks ended their relationship and returned to her family home in California. Frustrated by what she described as Bundy's immaturity and lack of ambition, psychiatrist Dorothy Lewis would later pinpoint this crisis as probably the pivotal time in his development. Devastated by Brooks' rejection, Bundy traveled to Colorado and then farther east, visiting relatives in Arkansas and Philadelphia and enrolling for one semester at Temple University. It was at this time in early 1969, Rule believes, that Bundy visited the office of birth records in Burlington and confirmed his true parentage. Back in Washington in the fall of 1969, he met Elizabeth Klerkfer, a divorcee from Ogden, Utah, who worked as a secretary at the University of Washington School of Medicine. Their stormy relationship would continue well past his initial incarceration in Utah in 1976. In mid-1970, now focused and goal-oriented, he re-enrolled at UW, this time as a psychology major. He became an honor student, well regarded by his professors. In 1971 he took a job at Seattle's Suicide Hotline Crisis Center. There he met and worked alongside Dan Rule, a former Seattle police officer and aspiring crime writer who would later write one of the definitive Bundy biographies. The Stranger Beside Me, Rule saw nothing disturbing in Bundy's personality at the time, describing him as kind, solicitous, and empathetic. After graduating from UW in 1972 Bundy joined Governor Daniel J. Evans' re-election campaign. Posing as a college student, he shadowed Evans' opponent, former Governor Albert Rossellini, recording his stump speeches for analysis by Evans' team. After Evans' re-election he was hired as an assistant to Ross Davis, chairman of the Washington State Republican Party. Davis thought well of Bundy, describing him as smart, aggressive, and a believer in the system. In early 1973, Despite mediocre law school admission test scores, Bundy was accepted into the law schools of UPS and the University of Utah on the strength of letters of recommendation from Evans Davis and several UW psychology professors. During a trip to California on Republican Party business in the summer of 1973, Bundy rekindled his relationship with Brooks, who marveled at his transformation into a serious, dedicated professional seemingly on the cusp of a distinguished legal and political career. He continued to date Klopfer as well, though neither woman was aware of the other's existence. In the fall of 1973 Bundy matriculated at UPS Law School and continued courting Brooks, who flew to Seattle several times to stay with him. They discussed marriage. At one point, he introduced her to Davis as his fiance. In January 1974, however, he abruptly broke off all contact. Her phone calls and letters went unreturned, finally reaching him by phone a month later. Brooks demanded to know why Bundy had unilaterally ended the relationship without explanation. In a flat, calm voice, he replied, Stephanie, I have no idea what you mean and hung up. She never heard from him again. He later explained, I just wanted to prove to myself that I could have married her. But Brooks concluded in retrospect that he had deliberately planned the entire courtship and rejection in advance as vengeance for the breakup she initiated in 1968. By then, Bundy had begun skipping classes at law school. By April, he had stopped attending entirely. As young women began to disappear in the Pacific Northwest,
Washington, Oregon. There is no consensus on when or where Bundy began killing women. He told different stories to different people, and refused to divulge the specifics of his earliest crimes, even as he confessed in graphic detail to dozens of later murders in the days preceding his execution. He told Nelson that he attempted his first kidnapping in 1969 in Ocean City, New Jersey, but did not kill anyone until sometime in 1971 in Seattle. He told psychologist Ark Norman that he killed two women in Atlantic City in 1969 while visiting family in Philadelphia. To homicide detective Robert D. Keppel, he hinted at a murder in Seattle in 1972, and another in 1973 involving a hitchhiker near Tumwater, Washington, but refused to elaborate. Rule and Keppel both believed that he may have started killing as a teenager. Circumstantial evidence suggests that he abducted and killed eight-year-old Anne-Marie Burr of Tacoma in 1961 when he was 14, an allegation he denied repeatedly. His earliest documented homicides were committed in 1974, when he was 27 years old. By then he had mastered the necessary skills, in the era before DNA profiling, to leave minimal incriminating evidence at a crime scene. Shortly after midnight on January 4, 1974, around the time that he terminated his relationship with Brooks, Bundy entered the basement apartment of 18-year-old Karen Sparks, a dancer and student at UW. After bludgeoning the sleeping woman senseless with a metal rod from her bed frame, he sexually assaulted her with either the same rod or a metal speculum, causing extensive internal injuries. She remained unconscious for 10 days, but survived with permanent disabilities. Less than a month later, in the early morning hours of February 1st, Bundy broke into the basement room of Linda Ann Healy, a UW undergraduate who broadcasts morning radio weather reports for skiers. He beat her unconscious, dressed her in blue jeans, a white blouse, and boots, and carried her away. Female college students continued to disappear, at the rate of about one per month. On March 12, Donna Gail Manson, a 19-year-old student, at the Evergreen State College in Olympia, southwest of Seattle, left her dormitory to attend a jazz concert on campus, but never arrived. On April 17, Susan Elaine Rancourt disappeared while on her way to a movie after an evening advisors meeting at Central Washington State College in Ellensburg, southeast of Seattle. Two female Central Washington students later came forward to report encounters, one on the night of Rancourt's disappearance, the other three nights earlier, with a man wearing an arm sling, asking for help carrying a load of books to his brown Atan Volkswagen Beetle. On May 6, Roberta Kathleen Parks left her dormitory at Oregon State University in Corvallis, south of Seattle, to have coffee with friends at the Student Union building, but never arrived. Detectives from the King County Sheriff's Office and the Seattle Police Department grew increasingly concerned. There was no significant physical evidence, and the missing women had little in common, apart from being young, attractive, white college students with long hair parted in the middle. On June 1, Brenda Carroll Ball, 22, disappeared after leaving the Flame Tavern in Berrien. Washington, near Seattle-Tacoma International Airport. She was last seen in the parking lot talking to a brown-haired man with his arm in a sling. In the early hours of June 11, UW student George Ann Hawkins vanished while walking down a brightly lit alley between her boyfriend's dormitory residence and her sorority house. The next morning, Three Seattle homicide detectives and a criminalist combed the entire alleyway on their hands and knees, finding nothing. 
After hawkish disappearance was publicized, witnesses came forward to report seeing a man that night in an alley behind a nearby dormitory, on crutches, with a leg cast, struggling to carry a briefcase. One woman recalled that the man asked her to help him carry the case to his car, a light brown Volkswagen Beetle. During this period, Bundy was working at the Washington State Department of Emergency Services in Olympia, a government agency involved in the search for the missing women. There, he met and dated Carol Ann Boone, a twice-divorced mother of two who, six years later, would play an important role in the final phase of his life. Reports of the six missing women and Sparks' brutal beating appeared prominently in newspapers and on television throughout Washington and Oregon. Fear spread among the population, hitchhiking by young women dropped sharply, while pressure mounted on law enforcement agencies. The paucity of physical evidence severely hampered them. Police could not provide reporters with the little information that was available for fear of compromising the investigation. Further similarities between the victims were noted, the disappearances all took place at night, usually near ongoing construction work, within a week of midterm or final exams. All of the victims were wearing slacks of blue jeans, and at most crime scenes, there were sightings of a man wearing a cast or a sling, and driving a brown or tan Volkswagen Beetle. The Pacific Northwest murders culminated on Sunday, July 14, with the broad daylight abductions of two women from a crowded beach at Lake Sammamish State Park in Issaquah, east of Seattle. Five female witnesses described an attractive young man wearing a white tennis outfit with his left arm in a sling, speaking with a light accent, perhaps Canadian or British. Introducing himself as, Ted, he asked their help in unloading a sailboat from his tan, or bronze-colored Volkswagen Beetle. Four refused, one accompanied him as far as his car, saw that there was no sailboat, and fled. Three additional witnesses saw him approach Janice Anot, 23, a probation case worker at the King County Juvenile Court, with the sailboat story, and watched her leave the beach in his company. About four hours later, Denise Marie Nasland, a 19-year-old woman who was studying to become a computer programmer, left a picnic to go to the restroom and never returned. Bundy told Stephen Michaud that Ott was still alive when he returned with Nasland, and that one was forced to watch as the other was murdered, but he later denied it in an interview with Lewis on the eve of his execution. King County Police, finally armed with a detailed description of their suspect as well as his car, posted flyers throughout the Seattle area. A composite sketch was printed in regional newspapers and broadcast on local television stations. Elizabeth Klerpfer, Anne Rule, a DES employee, and a UW psychology professor all recognized the profile, the sketch, and the car, and reported Bundy as a possible suspect, but detectives, who were receiving up to 200 tips per day, thought it unlikely that a clean-cut law student with no adult criminal record could be the perpetrator. On September 6, two grouse hunters stumbled across the skeletal remains of Ott, a Nasaland near a service road in Issaquah, east of Lake Sammamish State Park. An extra femur and several vertebrae found at the site were later identified by Bundy as George Ann Hawkins. Six months later, forestry students from Green River Community College discovered the skulls and mandibles of Healy, Rancourt, Parks, and Ball on Taylor Mountain, where Bundy frequently hiked, just east of Issaquah. Manson's remains were never recovered. Idaho, Utah, Colorado in August 1974, Bundy received a second acceptance from the University of Utah Law School, 
and moved to Salt Lake City, leaving Klerpfer in Seattle. While he called Klerpfer often, he dated at least a dozen other women. As he studied the first-year law curriculum a second time, he was devastated to find out that the other students had something, some intellectual capacity, that he did not. He found the classes completely incomprehensible. It was a great disappointment to me, he said. A new string of homicides began the following month, including two that would remain undiscovered until Bundy confessed to them shortly before his execution. On September 2, he raped and strangled a still unidentified hitchhiker in Idaho, then either disposed of the remains immediately in a nearby river, or returned the next day to photograph and dismember the corpse. On October 2, he seized 16-year-old Nancy Wilcox in Holiday, a suburb of Salt Lake City, and dragged her into a wooded area, intending to de-escalate his pathological urges. He claimed by raping and then releasing her, but he strangled her accidentally. He said, in the process of trying to silence her screams, her remains were buried near Capitol Reef National Park, some 200 miles south of Holiday, but were never found. On October 18, Melissa Ann Smith, the 17-year-old daughter of the police chief of Midvale, another Salt Lake City suburb, disappeared after leaving a pizza parlor. Her nude body was found in a nearby mountainous area nine days later. Post-mortem examination indicated that she may have remained alive for up to seven days following her disappearance. On October 31, South in Lehi, Laura Ann Amy, also 17, disappeared after leaving a cafe just after midnight. Her naked body was found by hikers to the northeast in American Fork Canyon on Thanksgiving Day. Both women had been beaten, raped, sodomized and strangled with nylon stockings. Years later, Bundy described his post-mortem rituals with the corpses of Smith and Amy, including hair shampooing and application of makeup. In the late afternoon of November 8, Bundy approached 18-year-old telephone operator Carol Darrinch at Fashion Place Mall in Murray, Utah, less than a mile from the Midvale restaurant where Melissa Smith was last seen. He identified himself as Officer Rosalind of the Murray Police Department, told Darrench that someone had attempted to break into her car, and asked her to accompany him to the station to file a complaint. When Darrench pointed out that Bundy was driving on a road that did not lead to the police station, he immediately pulled to the shoulder and attempted to handcuff her. During their struggle, he inadvertently fastened both handcuffs to the same wrist, and Daron was able to open the car door and escape. Later that evening, Deborah Jean Kent, a 17-year-old student at Newmont High School in Bountiful, north of Murray, disappeared after leaving a theatre production at the school to pick up her brother. The school's drama teacher and a student told police that a stranger had asked each of them to come out to the parking lot to identify a car. Another student later saw the same man pacing in the rear of the auditorium, and the drama teacher spotted him again shortly before the end of the play. Outside the auditorium, investigators found a key that unlocked the handcuffs removed from Carol Darrench's wrist. In November, Elizabeth Klerpfer, having read that young women were now disappearing in towns surrounding Salt Lake City, called King County Police a second time. Detective Randy Hergesheimer of the Major Crimes Division interviewed her in detail. By then, Bundy had risen considerably on the King County hierarchy of suspicion but the Lake Sammamish witness considered most reliable by detectives failed to identify him from a photo lineup. In December, Klopfer called the Salt Lake County Sheriff's Office and repeated her suspicions. Bundy's name was added to the list of suspects, but 
At that time no credible evidence linked him to the Utah crimes. In January 1975 Bundy returned to Seattle after his final exams and spent a week with Klopfer, who did not tell him that she had reported him to police on three separate occasions. She made plans to visit him in Salt Lake City in August. In 1975 Bundy shifted much of his criminal activity eastward, from his base in Utah to Colorado. On January 12, a 23-year-old registered nurse named Karen Eileen Campbell disappeared while walking down a well-lit hallway between the elevator and her room at the Wildwood Inn in Snowmass Village, southeast of Salt Lake City. Her nude body was found a month later next to a dirt road just outside the resort. She had been killed by blows to her head from a blunt instrument that left distinctive linear groove depressions on her skull. Her body also bore deep cuts from a sharp weapon, a hundred miles northeast of Snowmass. On March 15, Valesky instructor Julie Cunningham, 26, disappeared while walking from her apartment to a dinner date with a friend. Bundy later told Colorado investigators that he approached Cunningham on crutches and asked her to help carry his ski boots to his car, where he clubbed and handcuffed her, then assaulted and strangled her at a secondary site near Rifle, Colorado, west of Vail. Weeks later, he made the six-hour drive from Salt Lake City to revisit her remains. Denise Lynn Oliverson, 25, disappeared near the Utah-Colorado border in Grand Junction on April 6 while riding her bicycle to her parents' house. Her bike and sandals were found under a viaduct near a railroad bridge. On May 6, Bundy lured 12-year-old Lynette Dawn Culver from Alameda Junior High School in Pocatello, Idaho, north of Salt Lake City. He drowned and then sexually assaulted her in his hotel room, before disposing of her body in a river north of Pocatello. In mid-May, three of Bundy's Washington State Des co-workers, including Carol Ann Boone, visited him in Salt Lake City and stayed for a week in his apartment. Bundy subsequently spent a week in Seattle with Clope for in early June, and they discussed getting married the following Christmas. Again, Klopfer made no mention of her multiple discussions with the King County Police and Salt Lake County Sheriff's Office, and Bundy disclosed neither his ongoing relationship with Boone nor a concurrent romance with a Utah law student known in various accounts as Kim Andrews or Sharon Hour. On June 28, Susan Curtis vanished from the campus of Brigham Young University in Provo, South of Salt Lake City, Curtis' murder became Bundy's last confession. Tape recorded moments before he entered the execution chamber. The bodies of Wilcox, Kent, Cunningham, Culver, Curtis, and Oliverson were never recovered. In August to September 1975, Bundy was baptized into the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Although he was not an active participant in services and ignored most church restrictions, he would later be excommunicated by the LDS Church following his 1976 kidnapping conviction. In Washington state, investigators were still struggling to analyze the Pacific Northwest murder spree that had ended as abruptly as it had begun. In an effort to make sense of an overwhelming mass of data, they resorted to the then innovative strategy of compiling a database. They used the King County Payroll Computer, a huge primitive machine by contemporary standards, but the only one available for the use. After inputting the many lists they had compiled classmates and acquaintances of each victim, Volkswagen owners named Ted, known sex offenders, and so on, they queried the computer. For coincidences, out of thousands of names, 26 turned up on four separate lists. One was Ted Bundy, 
Detectives also manually compiled a list of the 100 best suspects, and Bundy was on that list as well. He was, literally at the top of the pile, of suspects. When word came from Utah of his arrest. Thank you for watching. Brought to you by Wikivd Documentaries. Please like and subscribe below. Please like and subscribe below.